All right. I believe we are. <laughs> we are in the. This this room is often referred to as the United Nations room. <laughs> Did and everyone grab a how, examination booklet on their way in? <laughs> and, and how appropriate for this panel, which we will now start. Welcome, everyone, uh, for the first panel of today at SPX. Um, this is Spotlight on uh, Kush, uh, the Latvian publisher of the International Vision. Um, we'll get into more detailed introductions momentarily, but I'll initially say we begin with uh, David Schilter. Um, uh, hello, hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 Lotte Vilma. Hi. Matt Madden. Hello. And Noah Van Skyver. Hello. Um, and uh, I was, I've been trying to get Kush over to SPX for many years. And I've been reading, reviewing their work for quite some time. And uh, very excited that they're show for the first time. And it's really among kind of one of the spirit of SPX, this kind of like uh, cross-pollination of ideas and publishers from around the world. Um, so let us get into this. Um, here's a, a little image oh, that nice. David <laughs> shared, what he drew, of their table, which is excellent. <laughs> um, and um, I think I will just sort of start with the beginnings um, I'll, and I'll start with, uh, with David, is uh, how, what, what was the inspiration uh, for starting Kush, which um, began as uh, a larger anthology and has kind of evolved into uh, smaller anthologies and then plus uh, an anthology series called, um, uh, so it was called Kush and now it's called, um, I believe it's, it's like, like sh Right? Yeah. More or less. <laughs> Nobody knows. It's like <laughs> <laughs> um, it's concept, it's the letter it's the letter this. S and exclamation mark, but it's you know, it's obviously that's shh. Um and that series is each issue is one artist, approximately sixteen pages or so. And they're all completely unique and beautiful. And uh, you know, the inspiration for starting it, but I'm also curious about like um the scene in Latvia in general, um, is there like, prior to this, like a bustling interest in comics there? Well, yeah, that's like the connection where we started because there was no bustling interest in comics, basically. <laughs> nobody knew what, or <laughs> nobody made comics. But um, I, I started it because I, I came to Latvia 16 years ago. I'm actually Swiss, and then mm. I was always talking to my Latvian friends about comics, but couldn't find. And then they like said, "Oh, you should do like this comic magazine." And I started up with them to, to yeah, to kind of introduce comics to Latvia. And then also we had the approach to show like really different styles. That's why maybe you think our books are really colorful and experimental and. Mer many different artists because yeah we want to show to the Latvian public and the readers that it can do like a lot of different things like can do stories and like all but like yeah people thought it's just like some funny things for children and uh, yeah, nobody took it serious but um i know that um uh your partner in publishing this is um uh, is it Sunita Sanita, we published together like 14 years. She now quit one year ago. I'm currently alone publishing, but yeah. What was, um, what was the differentiation in your roles when you were working together? The differentiation? Like what, what did each of you do? Did, were you like... Um, you we both did kind of everything. She was a bit more responsible for some administrative stuff because she better knows Latin language than me. But... Um, like when we edited, we did basically everything together, which was like interesting when we, for example, had open calls, mm. then um, like we selected the work together and when we get like some 150 or 200 submissions and we each choose 20 works, somehow it worked out that we chose the same almost like, and then we had like a few which we discussed 
And yeah, I only realized how crazy this is when we had an intern who chose like everything different, only like the two comics which I already told her before are the super cool. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, but yeah, and then in the end, when Sanita was working with us, she was often responsible for some like EU projects where we had some like bigger collaboration projects with other comic organizations and also um, kind of charity organizations and organizations who work with migrants. We made some comic projects huh. like um, tackling racism and themes like that and she was then basically working on those which is like there's some good funding to do some fun workshops and interesting workshops but there's a lot, lot of administration she took over and then basically I, I did already almost all like the Kush publishing by myself because she was busy like handling this other bigger project. So this is kind of the way it's been going for a while. Yeah, yeah like last couple of years. Um, I don't think I've ever seen an anthology or these groups of things you're doing in, uh, in, in Mini Kush. Um, of such a wide variety of styles. Um, and your own background is like a fan in Switzerland. Um, what kind of comics were you exposed to and had you always had an interest in like this kind of international vision? Um, yeah, I was quite lucky. Like, um, yeah, I don't have any art education. I was actually training to become a lawyer. I have a law oh. degree, <laughs> <laughs> master only. <I'm laughs> Don't ask me any law questions long ago. <laughs> <laughs> but then, um, yeah, in my hometown, there, like Lucerne, there's this oh. re really good festival called yeah, Fumetto, right. which... Um, it's one of the best in the world. Matt yeah. Has been there. Yeah, they have also incredible exhibitions and also artists from around the world. And hmm. like a friend like dragged me there once and we were like 14 years old, so I into basically every festival they made. And I got into Strapazin Comics, which is now, I think, already 40 years old, like one of the oldest and best German-speaking alternative comics anthologies. So the Kush idea was quite inspired by Strapazin and oh. through me attending all these festivals all the time and also volunteering and Doing, yeah, being there, I uh, already met a lot of artists and had some connections. And then it's like starting to invite these artists I knew there, or the very beginning translated also some works from Strapazin. And right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so here are, here's um, the sh anthology, <laughs> and these are some of the. Uh, the covers yeah, small like a <laughs> and like maybe we should just pause and have a bit of silence every time you mention it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the on. quietest panel ever <laughs> <laughs> um and this is just like if you haven't ever seen um uh, their work uh of this anthology this is like kind of a small small taste of like um the graphic ideas the, the styles um, wildly experimental to pretty straightforward, and it's all all in the same format, all in the same way. It's sort of you know saying this is all comics. Um, I'm going to get into. Uh, oh. Whoops, this is actually out of order. <coughs> this is uh, Noah's comic. Um, what number was this for a mini kush? Twenty um, something. Came out twenty. 17? Right? Yeah. yeah that's right. It was maybe yeah. around 70. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't number. know what the number was it on sold it. out also. So I got mats and Lotus minis. <laughs> yeah, no was anymore. And this is, um, I remember this. This was during like an especially fertile phase of Noah's career, which is yeah. fertile in itself. Um, always working, always doing different ideas. Uh, Noah, how did you come to, uh, to work with David? Uh, well, I knew about Coos from um, being friends with John Porcelino, who does Spit and a Half, 
and the Spit and a Half table always carried their comics and their books and stuff. And I really became a fan of it because it was a sampling of like artists, cartoonists from all over the world and all of their different graphic styles. So it was a really good taste of like, here's what's happening right now out there. Like, here's what everybody's doing. Uh, and I think I just, I responded to an open call for one of the collections, mm -hmm. one of the books for, uh, it was, uh, the theme was, because each of them had a theme. Right. And the theme was, I think, nautical. It was like something about, like, oh, do you remember this? It was like 2012, maybe, or 2011. Hmm. And I sent a five-page story that was published in one of those books. So that was my introduction to it. And then, later, years later, in 2016, I guess, I would have probably reached out to you about doing a mini, a mini of my own. Yeah, and yeah. Um, yeah, John Porcelino helped us extremely to get kind of in the new uh, the US market like he introduced us first like with his bit and a half distribution and mm -hmm. actually uh, John already wrote me uh, you got to check out Noah oh, oh okay yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you John <laughs> yeah um, for those who don't know John Porcelino um, he's the artist behind King Cat underground uh, zine legend um, someone I, I really wish had could be at this show, but he's kind of stopped it's doing conventions. Today's his birthday, by the way. So oh, happy, happy birthday, John Porcelino. We're getting it on record. Oh, wow. um, and his again, it, it often takes like someone with like who's willing to take a chance and has very broad taste, but he's done that for a number of people from Europe and, and elsewhere to and to bring awareness. And um, so uh, Noah, when uh, what would what did you think of the final product and kind of your place in this continuity of like really interesting artists? Well, I I loved I love the way that the comic is itself, and I and I was proud of the story I wrote. But the, the, my whole thing was I'm gonna do something that's a self-contained story that's just like really because a lot of the mini comics I've seen from you like you know don't have like a narrative necessarily, um, more like it's showcasing like visuals. Uh, an experimentation in that way, and I wanted to just do something that was just like pretty straightforward, uh, narrative kind of funny comic. So that that was my goal to to bring to it because I didn't see like a lot of basically like doing like a, a mini version of like what I was best known for in the states, like Fonte Bukowski. Like let me take right. that and then like give it to this uh, cool part thing, of you know? <laughs> you know? part of the quilt, yeah, as yeah. it were. Let me add that to this, you know. Um, next, we have uh, uh, Lotte's Comics, Worms, Cloud, Everything. And, you know, we see Noah's style here. And for, like, especially American comics, this is, like, a very familiar visual and narrative, as he says. Yeah. And he's part of this tapestry. And when you compare it to Lotte, your comics, um, it's, so, it's so different. And, um, and yet so delightful in its own unique way. And um, I'd like to ask you sort of a similar question is, when did you become aware of what uh, David was doing and um, how did you come to be involved? Because you've done a lot more than just this. I know you've been like an active part of, of the mm -hmm. anthologies. Um, yeah. So let's start there. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think I was studying in uh, Art Academy at the time. Uh, and there was uh, like, um, a thing where you could send your comics and if they choose it, you get a prize or something uh -huh. with about the Brussels sprouts, I think was the theme right. for the comic. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah, and I've always like since childhood liked to write and to draw and kind of like the relationship between text and uh, image. Uh, but I never really drew any comics, but I drew one comic for, um, for that. And I, d I didn't win anything. But then I met David at some party, and he was, oh, you drew that comic. OK, do you want to make uh, a comic for us, uh, for the an anthology of about poetry? And um, yeah, and I was uh, super happy about that. And I tried very hard <laughs> to do my best. And uh, yeah, and that's how I got into comics, was basically through Kush. Um, yeah. Because I was studying painting and I was really interested in illustration, but uh, I didn't have the experience of uh, comics. And yeah, 
and mostly I wrote uh, poetry. Um, so I think all that comes together in uh, how my comics are a bit weird. <laughs> they, they are, and um, something that I refer, I call comics as poetry yeah. to like kind of differentiate it from like a poem that's illustrated, the, the way it's integrated. Yeah. Is, um, uh, D Dava was like kind of an early person to pick up on it and publish it, and it's kind of, it's a, you know, with comics, it's like a, it's a niche within a niche within a niche, mm. and yet it's really vital and growing. Um, it, is this like doing these comics now like your primary mean of ex expression? Um, no, uh, not, not really, but it's something uh, that has become uh, a part of me and that I do. I work as an illustrator. Mm -hmm. um, that's my also my job. But um, yeah, and uh, I also still write uh, poems and I've uh, written some b two books, like one for smaller kids and other one for young adults, which I both wrote and illustrated. And so, um, yeah, I think I, illustration has become more like my my job, although it's still nice but it's it's also a job because i have commissions and it's not like just for fun and then comics are still pretty much for fun uh, and poetry is for like i don't know <laughs> meaning <laughs> in life <laughs> <laughs> i don't know something um yeah but i'm really glad that i got in uh, into comics uh, through kush because especially because th their work is so experimental and uh, I would have thought about comics more like okay so I read Donald Duck when I was a child <laughs> or something like that but um, in Kush I could see that I could do whatever I liked I think and so it's a very kind of free way to express myself then yeah let us move on to Matt Madden that's not familiar with Matt um, he's um He's always experimented with formerly interesting comics in a very playful way. And um, it's a comic called Bridge. Um, and it's wild. It's a really good one. Um, and Matt, how, to, how, how did you first become of Kush? What was your process of, of um, getting into it? It was a kind of a gradual thing because um, this story has a long history to it. And I've, no, I've known. Even, so I lived in France from 2012 to 2016, uh, based in Angoulême, doing a residency at the Maison des Auteurs, which is this amazing residency for cartoonists. So I got a chance then to go to a lot of European festivals, and David and Sanita were always at all of them. So I would see you at <laughs> Helsinki Comics Festival, and at Fumetto, and, uh, and at the Angoulême Festival, of course. And I've always been impressed. I was like looking at their stuff, and I think I even bef before before that I was aware, aware of it in the U.S. from seeing it at shows and probably from from Spit and a Half. Um, and uh, I really liked, like we're all saying, the, the variety and really getting a sense of younger artists. You know, a lot of women more more than you're seeing in a lot of other anthologies, uh, and definitely this more uh, art oriented, drawing oriented kind of cartooning and and, and art books. Uh, and people you're not necessarily seeing, like you're like not just new people, but people haven't been like discovered by even the bigger indie houses yet. Mm -hmm. So like you know, drawn and quarterly and association don't even know these guys yet. It's like you're getting people who are very young and haven't you know just starting out. So it's really exciting to sort of find new people, and a lot of them a couple years later you start seeing them, mm -hmm. they're having books published. Um, <coughs> this comic was uh, it originated as a 24-hour comic that I did in Angoulême right before the festival. And so a 24-hour comic is a thing that many of you might have heard of Scott McCloud invented, where you're supposed to r conceive, write, and draw, and ink, <laughs> and originally photocopy and, and uh, make copies uh, uh, and, and staple um, a 24-page comic book. Um, so uh, we did it in Angoulême, and I was the MC. And the way they do it in France is that they, in addition to the 24 hours, uh, Louis Tronheim, who was kind of the originated the, the project in, in France would have a different constraint uh, or rule at the beginning of each. It wouldn't be announced until the day of with the idea that he didn't want people cheating because like, it's not fair if you, ha you can just dream up a whole story and have it all kind of planned out in your head and then get down. And if it's like, if you're fast like Noah, you could do a 24-hour comic, you know, if you're, you know, just like that, you know. Um, 
So I was tasked with coming up with a constraint, and I came up with this, this idea that I really liked, which was uh, whatever the comic was, you had 24 pages, and each page had to represent the same unit of time. So if you said one minute, that would mean your comic would be 24 minutes long, mm. and each page would be like one minute passing. Um, people really liked it. I got a lot of good re response from it afterwards. Um, when I announced it at the festival, though, I hadn't chosen one for myself because I was trying to, you know, be in the good spirit of it and not not sort of have a have a leg up. So I opened it up to the floor, and Louis Strondheim was there. I said, who, "Who who has a unit of time for me to work with?" And he said, "Decades." <laughs> <laughs> and I, like my heart sank. Like that means I had to do a 24 page comic where every page 10 years pass, and so it's like 240 years in one story. Uh, so, anyway, it ended up actually really inspiring me and I came up with this sort of multi-generational three-part story that uh, I was really happy with, but uh, I'm not one of those artists like Noah or like Lewis who can actually draw something in 24 hours that would actually look any good at all. So it looked awful, but the story was really tight. I came back to it in 2016 and I redrew it, but I, I didn't have to edit. It was like, it was really like I did very little changes to the writing. It was just making the art look, look good. Um, and I was showing it around, I showed it to a few other publishers, but, um, and I showed it to L'Association, who does the Pat de Mouche, which I think was probably right, right. an inspiration for, for David in the first place. That's a long running series of mini comics. Do you want to? It was kind of accident to have the same format. But Sorry? <laughs> it was kind of accident to have was the really same right? format. Well, I was assuming that because Pat de Mouche is um, done by the French publisher L'Association. I've seen them before, yeah. Yeah, since 1990 or something like that. We just really. didn't have any money and we came to the small <laughs> format. That was actually right. the thing, that we made something small. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, I was, I was having trouble finding a publisher for it. And it's kind of, you know, it's a 24 page story. It's not really a floppy length thing. Like I'd done Drawn Onward with Retrofit. Right. And that was 32 pages, but it's not quite enough for like, you know. Uh, and finally, I, it occurred to me to hit up David and I sent him a PDF and he really liked it. Um, and uh, it was really fun to work on because it was actually just a regular comic with white panel borders. And we were talking about how, first of all, like, you, mostly the stuff's in color, and this is like one of the few black and white ones. And then the format, you'll see there's like the, this decorative border on the top and bottom. That's not an original idea, but it came from a conference. We were talking back and forth about like, how can we fit this in the format of the book? And uh, so I came up with this, this, uh, this border format and the, and I can't remember when I came up with, or who, if you decided, pr suggested the black backgrounds, like a, you know, fully black pages. And it totally, it was like the missing piece of that story. Like I already liked the comic a lot, but when I saw it fully with the black background, I was like, oh, it's, it's, it's there now. This is, this is how it's supposed to look. Uh, so I was really happy That's about that. That's what the great editor does. Sorry? <laughs> no, yeah, no, it's true. It was a, it was, it was a really, you know, it's a good conversation. We had a bunch of back and forth about it. So uh, I usually don't edit much, so I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I try to leave the artist as much yeah. freedom as I can. But it's usually just like grammatical stuff. Yes, it's but. true. <laughs> yeah. Well, but this was like, a, it was a format issue. So it was more like, well, we got to figure out how to problem solve that, that issue of whether you're having a big black, you know, empty space in the page. So. Uh, anyway, so yeah, that's great. And actually, that was that was something I was uh, immediately wondering about. And your role as an editor and publisher and designer as well. Um, how much of all that is, you know, how much of an active hand do you take with your artists? Do your artists, does any of your artists, actually seek out direction, or they're like, or do just send you the story? Um, you know, if it's in the theme, like if it's in the big books. Or in the single book, it's like, you know, I have a 16-page story, and you're like, okay. Or it, it, does it depend on the artist, or is it mostly pretty laissez-faire, where everyone's kind of has pretty has a lot of freedom? Um, I like to give the artist as much freedom as possible. Um, Sanita was slightly more um, trying also to edit or discuss more, but then also it depends on the artist. Some artists like show us sketches and like ask for some advice, but like most of them, like they do like the whole comic from A to Z all by themselves. Uh, just recently we made a Monokush, a new one, which is debuting here. And there I kind of really helped with arranging the pages and putting like in the right format, but like the drawing or the story, I uh, didn't change anything. But um, yeah, it's more from my side, maybe some design suggestions for and like to how to have the book. 
but in the story, we, yeah, we don't want to interfere too much. It's an alternative anthology. We're not a big publisher who must like sell like 10,000 copies and have to think of the audience like what they want. And especially the mini Kush concept, we like to try to have like a lot of these small mini comics and then once in a while we have a bestseller like Noah which then <laughs> helps kind of <laughs> wow, I didn't know finance I didn't know about the that. other comics from some more obscure unknown artists who don't sell so fast or but so yeah, it's also not really a conscious decision because no <laughs> ask us if we publish him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so but you're you're branching out into like the bigger books, of like it's basically single like graphic novels and stuff. Like at the table, you have I think three or something that was just. Um, yeah, we published a couple of them five years ago when we had our oh. ten years anniversary, and now kind of yeah. this year I'm working on like seven or eight new ones, like Lotte is also yeah probably. Oh coming out next year yeah. but this is also connected to the Russian war in Ukraine because everything's getting super expensive and I was just like oh, I have to spend money spend money <laughs> everything I yeah. have that because it will not be worth it anymore like oh, no. um, yeah the production costs are almost doubled like the printing costs so I thought okay now I should like really quickly um, make a bunch of books. And so actually the newest uh, monokush, I even did the design myself because the, my both designers were in holidays and <laughs> I was like, okay, I want to print this fast. Yeah. <laughs> that series is called Monokush? Like yes. a, the individual books? Mm. Interesting, yeah. That makes sense. And then I have one more question. Is that do, you, do you allow artists to do like multi... Have you... The mini comics, have you had uh, one artist do multiple mini comics for you before? Or do you try and give each artist their one comic and then move on, you don't? Actually, in the beginning was more like that we thought, yeah, it's like one per artist, but we are doing it for now around 12 years. So I'm yeah. like, at least the yeah, Latvian artist also who did one like really long time ago because we want to promote also like Latvian artists. I want to give them a chance to make another one. Yeah. But then Aiden Kosh, um, some oh, years yeah. ago, yeah. sent oh, me I something. And I don't remember if she, she sent it to me to publish or just to show, but then was like, okay, I have a free spot, and then like publish her second mini Kosh. And then DeForge did one too, didn't he? He did only one. Okay, though. yeah. yeah. Huh. But yeah, so it's actually up to now, it's only two artists to have two minis, but I'm quite open to yeah. republish. Um, publish more from the same artists but yeah we're always interested in like really discovering new artists also so but also at the same time we should take care of our old artists <laughs> and publish <laughs> them again <laughs> yeah okay. um how often do you do uh open calls for um, um your anthologies i assume that for the mini couche that's not so much of an open call thing that's something you seek out or that's something the mini kush we only once did an open call, and um, but for the anthology, like recently we did like once a year almost. We're now actually doing an open call in like five weeks. I can already say the theme will be obsession, so if <laughs> someone wants to cheat, already start. <laughs> but um, yeah, the open call we get like really, really a lot of submissions, and then I always feel bad that we have kind of to reject like 95% mm -hmm. of them. But also I try, um, actually one artist, Finnish artist sent us something for open call, but I didn't think it would fit into the anthology, but then ask her to do a mini kush instead right. with a complete different story. So, mm. so if you're not published, after the open call, it's not the end. <laughs> also, we usually try to keep the themes open so the artists can use the stories for themselves or make like a little scene or yeah, submit it to others. But yeah, it's always a lot of work, the open call. We are looking through all of the works and we try to reply to everyone that we receive the work. and. And, but yeah, it's always great to really discover new artists. So, And the international reach has always been the most fascinating thing to me. It's because obviously, I know one of your missions is to like highlight, you know, Baltic comics. Um, but uh, 
everywhere from everywhere in Asia, the Americas, Europe. Um, do you ever make like a conscious decision to like what's happening in what's happening in South America right now? Do you like ever try and put feelers out or like kind of look in, in addition to people contacting you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also, like usually we have a theme, but like, yeah, we now published already 55 anthologies and always just having a theme is kind of boring. Uh, well, then the theme is like um, Australian comics or, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it's still a theme, but the, well, we just ask, like make special issue just with mm. Australian cartoonists. Or you did a Canadian one, right, with Annie Koyama? We, this was collaboration, like it was, it was mixed. It was like Koyama artist and Kush artist, but it was like half, half oh. Canadian. It wasn't a special Canadian issue, but oh, it was okay. really a lot of Canadians. Well, that's what they told. I tried to submit, and they said it's Canadians only. No, I swear. Okay, yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Well, and we made a chap a Japanese issue, and this was also then we like made a business trip to Japan and went oh. like to. Uh, the comic shop Takoche, which is distributing us for a long time, and they made a party and invited a lot of local cartoonists. And mm -hmm. then we also visited like different gallery. We visited the publisher of Yuchi Yokoyama, mm -hmm. which actually contacted us before because she was for some reason in Latvia, but I wasn't yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> but then <That's> finally <laughs> happened to meet up in Japan. Oh. And what was the reception yeah. like when you went to Japan in terms of like your comics? Did you find that you had a, an audience there? I think Japan is quite difficult for us. They're mm. um, it's kind of insulated uh, yeah. comics scene. They have like a different comic scene. It was also quite difficult to find like mm. this alternative artist. Uh, mm. I mean, they have huge, huge um, comic culture, but mm. like people who make like stuff fitting for Kush. Or well, like the stuff we like, the it's um, not that easy to find. But I think yeah, we made like a really interesting issue, and probably there's a lot of really great artists still which we we didn't find. But How long ago was that you did that issue with Japan? That's, um, four four years ago. Maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah, I haven't seen that one. What I'll bet John Forcelino has it. Yes, yes, you should have it. Um, um, you said you had no background as as an artist. Um, how did you get up to speed on doing books and minis with such amazing production values and design? Do you have, is there someone you work with on that or is that just something that you kind of taught yourself? Uh, David. <laughs> <laughs> you. <laughs> you, how did yeah, you get so, so good? <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> Yeah, I'm spaced off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was basically asking about like, you know, you said you didn't have an art background, and yeah. yet your books are so well designed, and um, the production values themselves. From I the don't very know. Beginning. Maybe it's some Swiss minimalism which we have. We actually had the very first Kush issues. We had designer, and he like put like a lot of. Really, yeah, I made really crazy design, <laughs> just also nice, but there was always like, mm, let's not compete with the comics, like the comics are already so colorful, so let's keep the design as simple as possible. Hmm. But yeah, no. <laughs> and in terms of your funding, and like you have s so many comics in color and really vivid colors, is, is the funding what kind of makes that possible? The funding sure helps because actually after, well, the first year kind of self-funded the anthology and then we almost stopped it. We ha well, we actually stopped it and it was Kush. But then we found per accident some really small funding. That's how we came also to the really small format. But then in the same time, we um, then we finally started to re receive some government funding. There's competitions and First, we never got the money because also they thought the yeah, comics just for kids. But also, we collaborated with Contemporary Art Center in Latvia to make a huge exhibition, which was like really successful in the art scene. And somehow, also people from funding noticed that that comics can be art. And then now for the anthologies, yeah, mostly we have funding for printing which helps yeah to make it full color 
So printing black and white is not that much cheaper. The mini coach are usually almost all self-funded, well, funded through sales in the end. We have some funding from Portuguese library. We have like quite a lot of Portuguese mini kush, but they wow. have like really, really good comic scene. So I'm like every year again, like asking for funding. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, can I still ask? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, That's actually very interesting. Like I was aware a little bit of the Portuguese scene, um, but what, what countries have surprised you that have like a lot of cartoonists that just, you weren't aware of before until you kind of went looking or they came to find you? Like what, what, con what, what countries in particular are like most interesting in that way for you? Like yeah, Porto Portugal is one of the most surprising, but then yeah, neighbor Spain actually has a huge scene of really interesting alternative artists. And now I think you should look out for German comics. Well, it's like already the last 10 years with like Aisha Franz and Anna Haifisch and like they have really good young scene, they have some really good... Yeah, Colorama is a publi yes. publisher. It's good stuff. They have some yeah. good small publishers and that. really good schools. Yeah, with um, great teachers, with Anke Feuchtenberger and Attack. And like, um, yeah, we, um, we actually just established a relationship with FCX with the, the Goethe Institute, and they give grants for travel. And we brought oh, over nice. Elizabeth Piesch, mm -hmm. who's at the Silver Sprocket table, and that's... Germany is another one. I've had my on a long, long while as well. What about South America? What countries there have like um, have been able to, um, or Central America? There, it's a bit more difficult for me to find uh, uh, things. But uh, well, Colombia was like has interesting scene. There, we were invited to a comic festival, so I discovered some really nice young artists. I think Brazil has a really good scene. But um, yeah, what else surprised me, actually China, I didn't mention. We went there to a festival, and there's like really amazing scene. And yeah, recently was like another talk with Chinese publishers and people were asking them like, how, how do you get away like without um, censorship? Because they have quite strong censorship, but they said like, oh yeah, like nobody wants to make a bestseller. Like, you just have to publish less than 5,000 books and then nobody cares. <laughs> it's like, okay, 5,000 <laughs> books, like, uh, that's a good <laughs> amount for us. <laughs> but, but yeah, China so huge. And, um, yeah, I should we have a couple of Chinese minis also. You should check them out. They have like really good experimental artists. Mm. Yeah, because I was wondering, um, the publisher Paradise Systems, Ryan Martin, spent a lot of time over there and, and, and it's like I know a lot of the same people he published in his anthology popped up with you and I was wondering if you made a connection with him or is it just because of your travel there? Um, Orion contacted me once like if I would like to collaborate with him and make some minis together. He was inviting the artists and um, translating because he's a Chinese translator so he probably was the first one to introduced me to the Chinese comic scene. But then later, well, just before the pandemic, we got invited to Picnic Art Festival in Shanghai. Mm. And actually to a couple of more Chinese festivals, which we couldn't attend then because of the COVID. But yeah, there at the Picnic Art Fair, I could really see like there's like people are really interested. There's a young scene who are like really seeking out alternative comics and a lot of people making interesting work. What I noticed about a lot of the Chinese artists is that I was like, who are they drawing from? And I noticed is that who they're not drawing from is like Japan or, or Korea. They're like uh, almost looking like to Europe. If you, what, what have you noticed about their style? And what kind of comics have you seen that like kind of make it have made it over there from the like the American and European scenes? Oh, it's funny. Yeah, I found like in this um, in the flea market, I found like really old copies of uh, Tintin and um, like uh, like like Chinese artists who draw Mickey Mouse. <laughs> like a really really cool Mickey Mouse comic from China. <laughs> Um, now the younger artists, um, I think they're on Instagram and just like looking for interesting visuals and um, and maybe yeah they don't have like such a big comic tradition and 
try to do their own thing, which would be similar to Latvia, which has no comic tradition. So somehow the Latvian scene <laughs> seems to be in a way similar to China. You cannot really like find like one line. If you look like at Italian comics, you know, like quite often you can see, okay, it's Italian. They have like this strong tradition. Right. Kind of circling back around to my first question about um, a scene in Latvia. This, you've been you've been doing this for 15 years. Um, how have you seen, you know, the the scene grow? Do you, is it there? Is there more enthusiasm for it there now? Are there small festivals there now? Yeah, I'm like, unfortunately, we still have the monopoly of comics in <laughs> Latvia. I would actually be happy if someone would like also publish more comics, but I think it's still a problem. Like the market is super small. There, Latvia is slightly less than two million inhabitants, so like publishing and translating a book to Latvian is quite expensive. And but the Avon Children Book Publisher now starts publishing actually quite good comics which work for all ages. But like the illustration scene extremely developed. There was um, one magazine which also worked internationally who made like illustration. It was like an uh, illustration anthology. was like quite inspired by Kush actually. Just they didn't want to make comics, just illustration and fine art and then also two artists which we published earlier or no, actually now already like three artists they're teaching at the art academy they're teaching illustration and the, I think like the illustration scene in Latvia is quite um, mm. yeah. like really well yeah, developed the last 15 years like this children book publisher picked up a lot of artists to like first got to experiment in Kush to like illustrate full books with them. So it's a it's a fertile ground for experimentation. So yeah, Kush is kind of the fertilizer for the bigger <laughs> publishers in that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, it would be nice uh, if there's some, there's not too many people yet making bigger graphic novels or mm -hmm. most artists usually, like when they're in some panel talk, like, oh, why do you make comics? Oh, yeah, because David invited me. <laughs> <laughs> so, But some people are, also doing by themselves and mm. yeah Lotte is now working on a book and I'm excited for that. And uh, my, my final question would be for, for Lotte, what is you know coming up having no connection to comics, um, how do you see yourself in this scene and are you able to like see and collaborate or you need to talk to peers now in Lafia? Um, you know do you find do you feel yourself part of a scene? Yes, and I really like the, the illustration and the comic scene that is there. Um, and I remember that, uh, yeah, because I studied painting, I also spent some time in like that kind of scene with the galleries and uh, painters and artists like that. And I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't feel good there. <laughs> but then I started to study illustration and uh, hang out with Kush and uh, other illustrators. And it just felt so so much cooler and nicer and funnier and it wasn't so stiff and kind of I don't know it felt very snobbish <laughs> <laughs> and yeah and so I really like this the scene that is going around in Riga now and lots of my friends are also like illustrators or um, have worked with Kush as well and yeah that's great and, and the the last last question is, um, you know, you're coming to SPX for the first time. Uh, what's your reaction been to like the show and the, uh, the kind of things that you've seen compared to like the things that you're used to and things that you've seen uh, in Kush? Mm, it's interesting. Um, there's stuff that I have seen uh, through internet, um, and it's really nice to uh, see it in uh, like real life or buy some books that I want to buy for a long time. Um, yeah, and it's 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 different um, than some of the like festivals I've been in Europe, and there are more also like more classical comics or more traditional comics. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's really nice to be in a, like a bigger event for comics because yeah, as David said, we don't have that yet in Latvia really, 
and yeah, so it's great. Some scene festival. Yeah, now, we have a scene festival. Not organized. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Well, excellent. Uh, we have uh, we have time for a few questions. Anyone has any? Uh, I believe I had heard about them, but um, it's gone, yeah. I'm sure the pandemic is getting more complicated. Yes, we start the residency program actually shortly before the pandemic. But so we had a short break, and some, some cartoonists actually had to escape like quickly because you know, like all flights were shut down. Mm -hmm. Like we had Amanda Wahamaki who was like escaping, <laughs> going on to the ferry like really fast. But yes, so we were renting together, like we were doing this residency together with a photography uh, association. Um, they're doing photography summer school, also really international. They have like famous photographers around the world to make workshops for them. and. They were running the residencies for a couple of years, but they ran out of funding and then, well, they rented the flat and then they thought, okay, we could share the residency with someone to like keep the costs lower. So, but yeah, we're renting a flat in the center of Riga together for like, it's quite a big flat with three individual rooms and every month there's like one cartoonist and two photographers or two cartoonists and one photographer. So we split the rooms and then, yeah, we do open calls for people who can apply. It's not, um, yeah, we cannot found that, like the artist has to pay $300 per month, but often we can try it then to help uh, find funding. And then they have some public events usually so that's actually quite nice for the local comic scene we meet up every month with some mm. comics talks comic readings some um, workshops and yeah artists can choose to be one or two months in Riga and work on their own projects we don't want them that they like do something specifically for us but that they just get time because sometimes you need time alone to concentrate or like away from home, not alone. And yeah, they can make new friends and get new inspiration. And we published, I think, some mini kush now, which was made in the residency and some like shorter comics. But usually yeah, some people come, they work on their bigger projects. But yeah, if the pandemic has been a bit difficult, a lot of people are canceling and now they want to come again. And so with the open call, it's a bit weird that um, it's like 10 places, but like five is like from people who already got the open call before, but had to cancel, so. But I hope like after like half a year, it will be better finally. <laughs> but yeah, it's still running. Hopefully. Um, do you have any like dream cartoonists that you would like hope to publish one day uh, in in any form? Someone like uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> they're right here. <laughs> That's an excellent. No, what know. an answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's like a lot of artists out there which are interesting, but um, I'm usually really happy to find some like new artists and then after they get published by Fantagraphics and they can mm -hmm. say like, oh, I'm, I'm the first publisher. <laughs> <laughs> I made them. <laughs> Please, uh, hold, hold on one side, someone's gonna bring down a mic for you. There you go. Yes, hi. I was wondering when you pull together works from so many different continents and, and is there a lot of effort during the editorial process going into translation, or do the artists often maybe compose in one language, maybe English, or how much labor is involved in just the language, you know? Um, yeah, the anthology is in English, so the artists usually send everything in English. There's some, um, we have this guy called König Luke, which is in every issue, which made them um, 
this T-shirt. <laughs> so he makes the comics in German, and then I try to translate it. And we have a proofreader, American, which is which often I send the comics if I think something is off. But maybe sometimes, I don't know if you found a lot of mistakes. We don't proofread always all the comics <laughs> if they seem more or less right. But yeah, yeah. No, I found them to be good. I, I haven't. I don't recall coming across any like uh, glaring mistakes or uh, awkward English. It, it's is difficult because it is a, it is a a trend in um, European anthology publishing, especially to do stuff in English, just because it's the easiest, you know, from you know across the board. But but sometimes you get artists that think their English is better than it is, and they write stuff in English, and it's actually pretty clunky. But but so I'm glad that I, yeah, it makes sense that you have the proofreader because. The Kush, the Kush stuff is usually pretty smooth reading, I find. Yeah, so the first year we made it in Latvian and then we translated it and like made the lettering ourselves or sometimes the artists made it. But hey Rob, yeah. what, other, what other images do you have? Uh, do you have more examples of uh, stuff? Because I think when you showed that screen, of more, I wanted to see what other... Did you have a box brown cover? Uh, yeah, actually, let's look at boxes stuff real quick. Yeah, box brown should have been here. I think he was here yesterday, but he yeah. I think yeah. caught the flu or felt like yeah, a big got, deal. Yeah, something so happened. I don't know. I but that what year was that? Was yeah, because actually I have to. Um, <laughs> box oh yeah, in the, in the beginning we made with subtitles. <laughs> yeah, we made subtitles. Yeah, and it's funny yeah, in Latvian you also translate the names. Uh, I mean. But Box Brown, the same Box Bronze is like the best name. He should go by that instead. Yeah. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't do that for my for my name, did you? Did that have no, a different no, anymore? It was oh, only like the very first mini. So oh, okay, that's funny. We tried to like be bilingual, but then we really didn't have any distribution in Latvia. Just one bookshop, so it was yeah. like, um, all right, you're doing doesn't make subtitle. sense, like, yeah. like, uh, yeah, <laughs> Box Bronze. Yeah, I was published in Russia few years ago, not since February, uh, and, the, and so it's Matt, it's with an, to get that A sound, they just do an E, like that E, the backwards three looking thing, so it's Met, 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 it. and so now I see a Russian reader sometimes on Instagram, like, oh, I read this great book, and it goes to you, by Met, Met, and M-E-T-T, Met. Met. Yeah. Hey, David, how often do, do you get, like, a submission from somewhere, like, that you invite them to do a mini, and then they, they turn it in, and you're like, oh, this sucks, but i got to publish it now, because I already said <laughs> that I was going to... Don't can't. I guess you man. Yeah, I guess you can't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> like it's too late, I've already um, said well, No, funny. actually, I, I got a different problem. I have one like Portuguese artist who um, I got funding for. He really wanted to do, do the mini, but I got the funding five years ago, and he's still working on the mini. Oh, and really? I'm <laughs> always writing him, and he's like, yeah, yeah I'm almost finished. <laughs> and he always sent super good sketches, but then he, <laughs> like, he starts all over again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, like Sisyphus in that rock, basically. <laughs> all right, um, that is all the time we have for this panel. Thank you, everyone, uh, for being here, and thank you so much to, for, uh, for everyone here. Um, please go to uh, the Kush table. Um, to find some table M one yeah. right. I'm actually going to be I'm going to be signing at the uncivilized table, which is uh, L one, which is just down the hall, down the aisle from the huge table. So if you want to pick up bridge um, I, and bring it down to me at uncivilized, I'd be happy to sign it for you. Yeah, are Kush. you also signing Noah still? Yeah, I'll be, at, I'll be at Fanographics the great after this. Yeah, and uh, Kush is M one, so um, please check it out. And thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.